Hey everyone, welcome to the Uncap Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Sands, and today we have a very special episode uh, for many reasons. One, we're joined by our good friend Ben Little from Four Score Beer, who we have we've dropped little tiny hints about this so far, uh, but we have not announced it yet. This may actually be what's announced. I don't know. Something may have already been posted on Instagram or someplace, and uh, there is something in the paper this morning. As long as I edit this quickly enough to get released uh, tomorrow, um, then we're also joined by Brian Voltaggio, celebrity chef, entrepreneur. There's probably other thing, TV star. Uh, that's enough. That's enough, man. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, also, a Fredericktonian, the nicest yes, place in the world. That's to live. most important. Yes. So we made a beer that uh, we want to talk about. And then we're also going to talk about Brian to introduce any of you who might not know who he is, but you probably do. Because um, he's, and especially in this area, very well known. But why don't we kick off with Ben, you telling us a little bit about the beer. So the beer is kind of inspired by the dessert kind of combination we came up with um, that includes blood oranges, um, coconut, kind of an ice cream sorbet feel to it, as well as like a cookie crumble. So, you know, we do quite a bit of that kind of stuff here these days. It was pretty easy to incorporate all that. The only thing we added a little bit of extra to was a different, couple different other kinds of oranges since blood orange itself in that level would come across quite tart uh, and, and almost distracting to the other flavors. So we also added just some standard, I think it's Valencia orange puree as well as some Caracara orange puree to the project. Um, it has our you know pretty standard high ABV sour base to it, uh, which after everything it's blended. Right now we're getting ready. It actually is toast. It was sitting on uh, toasted coconut, uh, over 150 pounds of toasted coconut uh, for about five days now. So we're getting ready to take it off that today and send it on to all of that orange puree uh probably just in a couple hours here so for uh the 25 more or more years i've been cooking i've never once had in my kitchen 150 pounds of coconut at one time so <laughs> <laughs> you were cooking in bigger batches than i am for sure sir <laughs> that's pretty amazing and yeah. thankful thankfully we picked the right brewery for mm. cramming fruit into beer uh, that's one of Ben's specialties. Uh, so he knew that we couldn't just use blood orange because I, I, I imagine there are some people who probably would have just crammed a full blood orange. We would have mm -hmm. taken a sip and then decided that, uh, boy, this was a bad idea. It's, yeah, uh, no, I, I love that you sell the foresight in that and that you use Cara Cara to round it out. So we use, um, ironically, I mean, I know we're talking about a dish that we're going to pair this very specifically with, but um, I have a dish on um, menu in one of the restaurants right now that is very citrus focused. And so it has Meyer lemon, it has Cara Cara orange, it has blood orange, it has ruby grapefruit, and it has all of these different citruses because then you can play off of each other with, it's a beet dish. So beets are very earthy and you have the citrus on top of it. And then, and then ironically coconut in that dish too, as well. So a lot of the same flavor profiles. And so, um, you know, for me, I just, I, I love the the fact that brewer chef there um, that you're thinking about, you know, that and in, in foresight and it's foresight uh, of the finished product. So I have a lot of questions. I know, I know everybody has questions, but you know, what, when, when you're taking on a project like this and I don't want to, you know, commandeer this or not, cause I'm just interested as a chef because I'm always working on food pairings and, and beverages. How do you start the process? Like, what, what is it that you're, I mean, I know we gave you some ingredients. I know we gave you the dessert. I know that you had sort of an idea of like, you know, how to put it together, but how do you get there? Like you're making such a big batch of beer, right? Like, you know, you're throwing kind of caution to the wind and I get it, but it's one thing to beer, to brew a beer that you like, you know what I mean? That you're going to love the flavor profiles and you have a vision, but then you have to like do it in a way where it's going to work with something else. What's your process? I think with this kind of stuff, what we've done here mostly is I don't drink a lot of this style of beer. I, I go home, mm. I drink my life, I drink Modelo. Um, so my whole thing here for a long time was trying to, the, the biggest, I guess, hurdle was brewing a beer that's not something that's to my profile. So mm. trying to figure out what our, you know, 
public wants from me and from us was a really good learning experience for me um, and recognizing, you know, part of this factor, it's a business. So I'm making stuff for me, but I'm also making stuff to sell. So over the time that this place has existed, the, the fruited sour line that we've had, it's gone through quite a bit of change. Um, in the beginning, it was purely fermented. It was all done in one tank. It wasn't able to ever be canned. Uh, so we've moved from that point to here. So over that time, I've been able to learn a lot. And I think, um, I think something you can definitely appreciate this is you've got to know what ingredients you're working with. Mm -hmm. uh, have some familiarity, have some favorites, have some comfort level, and just know how things play off of each other. Uh, knowing that, you know, X is going to bring Y out of this other ingredient is, I think, key in something like this. Uh, and then knowing that, like, specifically, we use toasted coconut flakes because those toasted coconut flakes are going to bring a lot more of a cookie aspect to things. They're going to mm -hmm. bring some cookie backbone and some of that, like, baked good sense, where if I use just regular coconut flakes, just unsweetened coconut flakes, it would be much more kind of, you know, suntan lotion-esque. Um, right. You know, beach drink kind of thing going on so i think with this it's just you know knowing the concept is great for me like somebody putting together you know what is this thing going to look like as a whole and me knowing what ingredients i have to use to get there to match it or come close to that same exact flavor profile mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah and i mean he, very much go ahead yeah so and he is for <laughs> and is there any fruit you haven't crammed into a beer yet uh, you know, I'm actually, I just got pomegranate for the first time. Um, going to work with some prickly pear soon. Uh, I love, have you, I love prickly pear and beer. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know Mike and Idiom just did some work with it. Uh, I have it was real it. that I will bring you up some whenever I come get, you have to try that beer. It is really good. Cause I had it in, a, um, actually a seltzer for the first oh. time from, oh, wow. uh, untitled art had, uh, seltzer with prickly pear in it and it was phenomenal and that that beer lush with prickly pear in it is really really good i can see that working well and we just brought in some Meyer lemon too i got a project coming up with another brewery um that we're brewing this upcoming week so it's stuff like that i've used that on a very small scale but trying to bring something like Meyer lemon to a big scale into a beer is going to be unique um i know there's some breweries that with lemon and lime in general don't actually sour their beer they just use that as purely the sour aspect of it. And it brings plenty of acidity. It brings plenty of tartness without having any, you know, lactic bacteria. In it. And I'm glad you pointed out uh, that you don't drink these beers. Cause I, I, I was going to throw you under the bus and be like, well, Ben actually, actually, Ben actually hates the beer he makes. <laughs> <laughs> Except for a few of them. I was going to say, I came to my box yesterday and uh, some of the corn lager we just did. I, I, you know, those things are, that's up my alley. <laughs> Thankfully, though, um, there is a large population of people buying beer that don't have the same opinion as uh, Ben, and they want uh, ugly, clumpy beer that is filled with fruit. So, yeah, so why? <laughs> um, so, what, what is? What, where do you think this took off? Like, who started this? I like um what brewery like started all of this beer? yeah like well or just it's just i i feel like it's been in the last what like maybe three years you're starting to see more yeah. and more of it and and i'm just wondering you know why this trend is kicked off i mean i'm not so people who, i think it's great you know it's people who don't like beer. beer is that what it is Really? A lot of it, yeah. A lot of, a lot of it is people so, who don't like beer because they taste it. Okay. And like, wow, this doesn't Makes even sense. taste like beer. <laughs> all right, got it. Like, I, I was just curious because all of a sudden I'm just seeing everybody heading in this direction like really fast, and that's true with anything, right? I mean, even in food, if I'm putting on a new menu item and it's a new ingredient, um, you start to see it, and, and seasonality, of course, but you start to see yeah. it pop up on menus all over the place, and you're like, wow, like, you know, it's morel season, of course, you're going to be on every menu. Um, so I was just curious if that's, you know, just what it was. It was just people who just don't like beer. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, <laughs> it, like, I, that's obviously a blanket statement that doesn't... No, of course. Because really there's plenty of beer lovers who do love that beer, too. Uh, there are also plenty of beer lovers that whine incessantly that they wish breweries right. would stick to making beer instead of making uh, fruit, fruit puree with a little bit of alcohol added in. Um, so do you think that trend was developed because of direct consumer from the brewer to the consumer? Because you, know, you have 
you know, every brewery has tasting rooms. I know that that goes years and years back, but I mean, more so now, like more so now you're, you're brewing direct to consumer and not, you know, to a restaurant, not to, you know, a liquor store. So you're, 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 you're getting that instantaneous feedback. You're having think- guests come in and be like, I don't like beer, but I'm being dragged down to this brewery to drink. And so is that why it developed? I, I do think that's part of it, but I also think like the proliferation of seltzer, um, which wasn't a thing, yeah. you know, I, I think that brought a new crowd into liquor stores looking for, you know, certain things that are different and they're more fruit forward. And then I think that a few breweries were experimenting. I know like lo- locally Burley Oak was one of the first ones in the nation, basically doing this style, if not the first, uh, in terms of the, you know, overly fruited kettle right. sours. And I think from there, it's like, oh, this new door is potentially open. And I, I think we all know that the general public likes a lot of processed flavors. Um, they like a lot of mm-hmm. things that are, you know, sweet and really, I, I guess, indulgent. So I think this just goes right down, you know, it, it, it's a, a fastball right down the center, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's it's tough to do because it's tough to understand how everything plays off each other. And so many people miss on it and or look at it in a way that's completely profit induced or something like that. And and those are ways where you're going to miss on this style. And I think that's yeah. why there's so many so far that have tried to like put a toe in and, and that's not going to do it. Uh, you're, you're not going to get there with just a toe. So, yeah. But I mean, I have to say, though, like there's, you know, I believe despite the fact that we all like to drink beer, beer, right? <laughs> beer tastes like beer. But um, but I think that what it does do is it opens up the door for a conversation like we're having now. So you can get very food specific, you know, to, to a pairing, which I think is, is really cool because you are able to layer in all of these flavors that traditionally were not necessarily used, um, making beer become more food friendly. And I'm not just talking about the, the sessional I'm having, you know, barbecue and we're going to just crush beer all day. I'm talking about like, getting very specific like this dessert. So um, I think though that opens up a whole new door for that, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, you know, especially as a chef, because, you know, as a, as a chef, I'm talking like, I mean, I went to culinary school, gee, maybe one of you or might've been in high school. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I went to culinary school a long time ago and started learning about food and wine pairings. And that was always what it was about. It was just food and wine. And now it's about food and beer and food and cocktails and food and seltzer. So things are different now. And I think it opens up a whole new door for us to be creative, which is pretty awesome. If you haven't heard about our beer dinners, well, now you have. Typically the last Tuesday of each month, we partner with a local brewery and craft an exclusive five course dinner. Each course is thoughtfully paired with some of the finest craft beer available. You'll meet the brewery, enjoy memorable pairings and service, and have a damn good time. Like us on Facebook to stay in the know when tickets become available, because they will sell out quick. There are many reasons why I have chosen District East for where I purchase beer. I love the flexibility of being able to make a custom six-pack or take home a crowler from one of the eight beers on tap. Their friendly and knowledgeable staff do an amazing job at keeping a diverse selection on hand. You can even purchase artwork from the monthly featured artist. District East is located on Northeast Street in Frederick in the same shopping center as Family Mill and Rockwell Brewery. You can find today's beer lists on the District East Facebook page or at www.districteast.beer. And I, th- I mean, if anything, these beers have made it very easy for places who do a lot of multi-course beer dinners mm-hmm. to pair something with dessert. Right. <laughs> so that that's um, so I guess we should talk about that real like for a little bit. That mm-hmm. this this beer is one hundred percent inspired by a dessert from Showroom in Frederick, which is got its name because it used to be a car dealership uh, and is now a one of the restaurants that uh, Brian is executive chef at. And it was um, a blood orange. Actually, it came from a text message from uh, Ken, who manages District East, uh, a picture of the dessert. And I was like, well, that sounds great. That would make a good beer. So and yeah, Ben was literally- like, yeah, I can do it. whatever, whatever you need. Uh, just tell me what you, what you want the flavors to be. I, I think that the dessert hits on every, you know, every uh, every note that everybody's looking for in, in these fruit sour beers. Blood orange meringue tart, vanilla tart shell, blood orange curd, taste Italian meringue. Like, 
like who doesn't like all of those flavors and you know going back to what you just said earlier is that people are looking for that indulgence and you know dessert is typically where it is right so um you know that's that like completion of the extravagant experience you know of going out to a restaurant versus trying to cook at home or order like we did all these crazy things over last year right so um I think now more it's important that we can have these fun, you know, sort of collaborations because people are itching to get out and try new things. You know, they've, um, you know, for me, I'm starting to see personally and fortunate for this conversation, more beer and wine sales than I've ever, I'm sorry, more beer and cocktail sales than I've ever seen in restaurants. It's because everybody drank wine and beer, like all you know, the whole time, you know, the whole time that they were on um, in quarantine, right? So, you know, now getting really creative with things and, and, and we're starting to see more gravitation towards that. Like our beer program has dramatically increased in restaurants, our, our, our cocktail program through the roof, like it's, it's completely different. So, um, yeah. And I think that, you know, the, this, this collaboration is going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I, I've, I've done this a few times. Um, you know, I've, I've made a couple of beers in the past with some other brewers, um, you know, around the area. Um, but this one's very specific, which I like, you know, th there's, those were more general. Like we, we, I paired one time with barbecue, a flying dog. It was just kind of like this, you know, this, this beer that ben, has subtle you, smoke to it. Were What's you that? there during that, Ben? I was. Were you? Oh, yeah. yeah ben, ben so, was. Ben yeah, you were there, right? So then. remember that? So it was like that subtle like smoke because, you know, ironically, I was on Top Chef in 2000 and when did I do that one? The first one, eight, nine, somewhere around there. And Stone was the, the you know, one of the like supporters of the show, right? And so this is where this all comes from. It's pretty funny if you haven't. <laughs> but um, so when we got done shooting, like we go back to the cast house and we'd hang out and they did reality. Well, there's, you know, there's beer, there's wine, there's, you know, a few other things. And everybody always went and they crushed all the, like, drinkable beer. Like, you know, the lagers, pilsners, and all of that from Stone. All that was ever left, if you were last to the fridge, was Stone smoked porter. <laughs> and, like, after being in the kitchen all day, you're just like, yeah, cool. Let's get a smoked porter and crush that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, that sucked. So I end up not liking smoked beer um for a really long time and because of that and so it was a challenge for me personally i was like i want to i want to make a beer you know with these guys it's going to pair perfect with backyard barbecues like a little subtle smoke so when you're you know you're eating that you know carolina style chopped pork you're like you're getting those like subtle hints but yet it's lean enough and it has a nice, enough acid you know from that smoke element that it cuts through that fat in the barbecue and that was a whole idea like that's the reason why we did that and but it was more for general drinking, not so you know specific like what we're we're talking about today with this you know very I think you know very intricate pairing, which I think is going to be really cool. If I remember correctly, that was like lightly smoked, right? Very lightly smoked. Yeah, because yeah. I hate 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 smoked beers. Yeah, no, um, so do I. But I actually, I, I, <laughs> I, have I did actually like. If I remember correctly, I did actually like that beer because it was like the slightest little hint and as long as you paired right. it with food it was really really good mm -hmm. yeah what the, what yeah that the, was cool i remember there were, and i can't even remember what it was for but flying dog had some kind of big event that i thankfully i, I was lucky enough to get invited to it was like oh was the was it that when they used to have the backyard symposium before um yeah before uh savor right Yes. Like it was the day before Savor, they would have it. Um, and that beer came out, and then you were there serving up barbecue. It was a really right. fun event. Yeah, it was a fun event. It was cool. And and I got a like character of, you know, from Ralph Stedman, you know, drew me. So I was like, all right, that's pretty awesome. Like I, I yeah, have uh, a like worth. on my wall. Yeah, I know. I, I it should be hanging somewhere down here um, <laughs> in my basement because <laughs> that's where I'm hiding right now from my kids where they're in virtual <laughs> school. Um but yeah, no, it's, it was it was a cool project. I always love working with brewers. I, I look at brewers and chefs. I mean, you're talking in here a lot of the things that I you know more so I think than and trust me, I'm gonna say something right now that every bitner in the world is probably gonna like blow up my phone. But you can get very specific with changing for flavor profiles on the fly. You can't yeah. do that with wine, you know. And and so 
that's you know i i i think that you guys and your understanding of balancing of acid and all that stuff just in this small conversation we're having right now like it it, it may all make sense to me because this is what i'm thinking of when i'm creating a dish and so i mean you very much are a cook you very much are a chef of beer so um which i think is pretty awesome um you know change your title <laughs> or not like brewers actually more i honestly you guys are cooler than we are <laughs> i just have to I, say that I, to be fair we have a lot more ingredients at our disposal we're not just working we with one we're not just yeah. working with two. you know what i mean so like the ability to to just take every piece of what we have and more and more coming available every day you know between hops between malt um for whatever it may be and just the better understanding so even they're, they're bioengineering yeast these days to bring out i'm brewing with one today that is I think a witch strain by nature, they bioengineered it to take out all the phenolic side of it. So it's just like pure red berry, strawberry, passion fruit kind of like theol based stuff. Like it, it's really cool stuff. So I've never worked with this one before. So we're brewing a West Coast IPA with it. And that was at the suggestion of the yeast provider. And there's just so much that we can do and so much that's our, that is at our disposal that never has been before. Well, that's one of those things that it's, it, it's a nice byproduct of when something becomes popular, there's a lot more money stuck into it. So now that craft beer is the place for so many people to make money off of those types of uh, that type of research and investments in developing that happens. Like it was a little while ago and maybe we're even seeing the fruits of that labor now because of all the different hop processing and varieties of, kind of ramped up lately and it was um actually it was a professor at mount st mary's had told me that like we we're on the verge of all kinds of different things happening with hops because of all the research being put into cannabis and that it, it was directly related to a lot of the things you can do with hops and as cannabis became more and more legal there was all this money being put into researching all the different ways to extract and and then we're seeing that as a byproduct in hops yeah. yeah there's a i mean i use a product called incognito and in all of our hazy ipas pretty much now all of them um that's that comes from that industry it, it's it's taking it to a flowable at room temperature extract that doesn't lose any of the properties effectively that are good you know there's always been bittering extract for that that can be used for some flavor and aromatic sides of things but but it's never really good for that the stuff is fantastic it increases yields it increases the quality of the product it's not cheap but it, it, it at the end of the day it's such a better product that i've bought so much of it it's not even funny you know cryo hops cryogenically freezing them to get a lot of the vegetative mm -hmm. matter out so now we're you know much more more expensive but you're on getting a different character out of hops because of that um you know in, especially in late edition and dry hop phases so the more aroma forward kind of stuff. And I know there's a lot of stuff coming out of New Zealand this year for the first time that's going to be a lot of fun to play with in terms of, you know, they're really working on a lot of the, not to get too like overly nerdy, but like, like the biotransformative properties, you know, what happens with the enzymes during fermentation and what is releasing some of these really positive things that we're looking for in hops. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming out of New Zealand this year between, you know, grape production. That's another side of things. It's like, the yeast that they're engineering for grapes to produce, you know, specific parts that they want out of fermentation and leaving the bad parts like sulfur behind. Like that's coming into the beer game too now because of that. So before we started recording, Brian, we were talking about how you had done, you had done a beer dinner with, and one of the beers with it was Sam Adams Utopias. Um, right, yes. Which People love that. Beer, <laughs> I know. Not, we all talked about this yeah. earlier. <laughs> oh, it went, went, another thing I did that pissed people off. I was at a beer writing conference down in Loudoun County, and mm -hmm. someone had a bottle of Utopias, and another person had a package of edible glitter. So I poured some Utopias oh. and mixed it with the glitter. And then <laughs> you made Goldschlager. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, that was considered to it's be pretty, very blasphemous. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, but so do you do you do a lot of beer pairings or yeah no or, we do okay um yeah no and, i've and and we're doing you know at one of the other restaurants at thatcher and rye we're doing a local wednesday um you know pairing and it, it's not just beer it's also um it, it's wine and spirits too but always we work with one producer 
Um, and it's, we're keeping it localized, you know, as much as possible, we're trying to do it within the County. Um, but you know, Latin, like this week we're working with old Westminster. So we're kind of going out of the County. Right. So, um, but you, you know, know, basically in Frederick, they right? basically are like, I mean, like a, if it's in Maryland, up. yeah, if it's yeah. in Maryland, you know, it's kind of like what we're doing right now. Um, and it's been great because, you know, one, we're creative every week because we're, you know, we're pairing, you know, these dishes, we're introducing new product to the restaurants, we're keeping it local. I mean, that was, you know, 12 years ago when I first opened a restaurant here, 13, um, it's been a long time. Um, you know, that was always, that was always our mission, but we didn't have everything that we have now. Right. So like, it made me rethink like over the course of closure, you know, when we're all in quarantine, um, you know, what was it going to be like when we were in these restaurants? You know, what, what were we going to be focused on? And knowing now there's so many others and producers, there's so much at our fingertips. We are, you know, we're a force like, you know, in this region of, of putting out some pretty incredible stuff. And so I want to help celebrate that, you know, um, and, and put that onto our menus. And as you know, we do attract to the restaurants, people from outside the area, sometimes it's their first time trying it. And, and so if we can help do that, that's, you know, makes me, makes me happy. And it keeps, uh, you know, keeps it all, you know, keeps the economy going like for us, you know, in, in our own town. So when you're pairing beer with food, do you look more for like contrasting flavors or just purely complementary or, or, okay. Yeah. It's either or. So that was the one thing I did pay attention to in wine class and in, in culinary school. I went to CIA up in Hyde park and we had this three weeks of wine class. And I thought it was cool because I was underage drinking, but it's the only place in America where you're allowed to do it. Cause it was a part of your curriculum. That was, that's a real thing. So, that's funny. um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, I mean, it was very controlled and tasting, you know what I mean? I mean, it was very done really well. Um, but is there someone standing next to you telling you to spit? <laughs> spit yes. <laughs> I think I was already of age, who knows? Cause I was a little <laughs> bit later, but my, my, you know, we, that's, that's where I, I got my knowledge. And obviously over the course of the year, working with sommeliers and, you know, and, you know, I, I worked for my mentor, Charlie Palmer was huge in the wine, you know, like, and that's, that's where I started to really develop the appreciation of literally pairing ingredients of food to wine. And, and so, yeah, it's either contrasting or complimenting, you know, that's the first, that's the first start, you know, so blood orange, blood orange. Okay. Let's go. Let's play off each other. Um, you know, is one going to have a higher acid content than the other, you know, is that something, do I need to balance sweetness on my side in order to complement, you know, his high acid, or do we go head to head, you know, do we go head to head on the acid and then just have an explosion with, which works typically like in first courses, you know, if we're doing like a scalloped crudo or something with a aguachile, you know, I might put a lot of acid into, you know, I might want that pairing to be a higher acid pairing because it will complement it. And it will draw out the other flavors, like the fattiness of the scallop, which you might overlook. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, it's a lot of tasting, you know, constantly tasting and like, you know, grains of salt, hits of acid, a little <laughs> bit of sweetness here and there, spice coming in for, for, for sure. Um, green notes when we're getting into spring, you know, then we're just talking about vegetal notes and stuff like, which is really cool. Um, roasted flavors where natural caramelization happens like in onions. You know, like, I mean, we all know beer, onions, and cheese, and like all of that stuff goes really well together. I mean, I'm chocolate, throwing out some simple stuff, but deep caramelized onions, not my cook saying, oh, like these are my caramelized onions. I'm like, no, you got 45 more minutes to draw that out. And so that's the difference of like taking an ingredient just a little bit further to make the pairing work. To all you craft breweries, wineries, and distilleries out there, listen up. Atlantic Custom Solutions is the real deal in providing you branded growlers, ceramics, glassware, and accessories like koozies, coasters, and keychains. Their high-definition digital printing, organic ink, and low-fire process ensures your brand is printed in ultra-high definition, giving you a one-up on the competition. We've used Atlantic Custom Solutions for uncapped branded glassware and couldn't be happier with it. Check them out. Visit www.brandmybeverage.com or give them a call at 434-286-4500 to learn more about how they can help you brand your business. Uncapped is brought to you with support from McClintock Distilling, Maryland's first and only organic certified distillery. They are well known for their award-winning gin and are rapidly growing a name for themselves for their matchstick bourbon and bootjack rye whiskey that have both won double gold at international spirits competitions. 
You can visit them in historic downtown Frederick along Carroll Creek for tours and tastings. Go to McClintockDistilling.com for more information. So actually, I don't think we ever went fully to to saying this part of it, but so when when this beer is available this Saturday, which is the 15th, it'll mm-hmm. be available at Showroom um, yeah. in Frederick. Right behind Showroom is District East, uh, one mm-hmm. of the sponsors of this podcast, and great one of uh, actually I'm not even gonna say one of it is the best beer store in Frederick, and at Four Score Beer up in Gettysburg. They will um, have this uh, dessert available too. Like Ben, you're going to have like sample size right. ones there just uh, for sale, and then obviously at showroom you can get the actual dessert that is the inspiration of this beer. Yeah, so we're sending you up tastings um, this weekend, right? And so we're launching, which I think is you know pr- pretty awesome. And it's all cohesively happening all at the same time, which I think is a lot of fun. So. Um, you know, we're going to run it. Um, we're going to run it until it runs out, but I mean, we're, we're going to run it for quite a while, um, you know, during the entire month of May and probably into June, even for as long as supplies last, um, this pairing. And so we're going to offer it because, you know, traditionally you might not like go through a full meal and then be like, all right, cool, let me finish with a whole, you know, beer at the end. So we're, we, are, we will be doing um, an offering you know, half pours for tables and stuff like that. So it's going to be a really cool, um, you know, process, um, you know, of, of getting this pairing out there to people and letting them try it, um, which I think is cool. And, you know, we can also do it to go from the restaurant as well. Um, you know, obviously, you know, unopened, but um, I'll, I'll let you deal with the legal stuff over there. But yes. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, we, you know, if, 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 you know, somebody wants to take that with them, we can package it up to go to as well and they can enjoy it at home. But um, it, this is a fun launch. You know, this is going to be great. Um, you know, we haven't done, you know, typically we've done beer dinners, right? Where I've peered, you know, paired along the way, you know, or maybe we've done like one dish. And I've always thought of it, you know, ironically from the savory side, you know, I've never, other than that Utopia's dinner that we did like that was back <laughs> in 2004, <laughs> um, I just did a dessert with that. I know you just jumped on, so we were talking about it earlier. And, um, you know, it, this is my first time doing it very specific to a, to a dessert, which I'm really excited about because um, not only are we starting to see, like you said, like these beers really coming available um, and these new fr- flavor profiles, but I, I, I like to end the meal with a beer too, you know? Like, why not? You know, especially something that's going to be, you know, super indulgent, like you said, and super satisfying and really rich and creamy. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, what is your favorite beer and food pairing? Mine? Beer and yeah. crabs, man. I'm Maryland That's guy. <laughs> beer and crabs. <laughs> what, what else would it ever be? <laughs> I, say, I, think, I think maybe I'm, nothing I'm not. Better. Nothing better I, than that. I love Maryland, but I, I guess I still haven't been fully made into a Marylander because I don't like I, like. I like crab. Okay. But I hate, like, I will never Good do the sitting, sitting around picking crabs oh, and like, I want right. someone else to do that work for me. <laughs> well, even a great beer and a crab cake sandwich is fantastic. You know, yes, like, I can 100%. About, it's the saltiness from you. Let's just talk about it. Really. It's old Bay. Okay. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? It's old Bay and beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what works. So we put old Bay all over French fries and malt vinegar, right? You know, like the boardwalk style thing that in a beer is fantastic as well. So just saying. Saltiness, yeah, uh, or, savoriness. Uh, a beer in Old Bay Wings, like a nice yeah, IPA, and some Old Bay Wings. Right. I love that. So now we've really gotten down to the root of the pairing. <laughs> <laughs> so really, it's just you need some yeah. beer in Old Bay. Well, it's also, it's like we're, we're just like on the cusp of the season, right? It's like just starting right now. And so that's what's on my mind. And I think very seasonally, had you asked me this question in November, it would be something completely different. You know, it just then it would be short ribs and a, a, you know, in a porter. Right. You know what I mean? Like then I'd be all about like rich flavors and sweet spice and like, you know, something completely different. So what style of beer do you could do you prefer with your crab or just whatever you're putting Old Bay on? Um, hmm. Me, I'm, I'm a straight up like just crushable, like 
Pilsner lager kind of deal. You know what I mean? Like something super simple where it's just, you know, low ABV. I'm going to have a few, yeah. <laughs> you know, not a lot of allergic stuff in it. <laughs> just like a straight up good old beer. Um, I love the old school IPA, like actually bitter, yeah. poppy IPA mixed with spicy food. Yeah, that's I, I like that too as well, especially if you're going to be using a lot of hot sauce in it. Um, you know, I, I when I when I do my crab butter, and this is you know for my wife, she's going to introduce me to this. It's you know malt vinegar or you know, like some sort of like flavored vinegar, sometimes ramp vinegar. I know it sounds fancy, but we get um, beer and then butter together that mixture then you dip the crab in so oh. typically what i try to do is pair to that first then the crab is just a vehicle for all the flavor right okay i don't know if they still make it brewers art made uh a four and a half percent saison called chop tank um i used to crush. i do remember that yeah mm -hmm. crab was like my favorite mm -hmm. pair of like, one time i'd go get grab a case of that and sit down all day and yeah that was yeah. that was oh that's memories right there <laughs> i know right <laughs> That's all. Awesome. Have you made it? Have you made a cold IPA yet, Ben? What's a cold IPA like? <laughs> are you talking about an IPL, like a hoppy lager? Yeah, well, that's not the cool name any longer, Ben. It is now a cold is that IPA. Really, is that going to be a thing? Is that thing? I swear. Up? Yes, I, it's I been happening. Seen, I've seen yeah, it popping up, like, but I I don't know how well it's got. Like, IPLs, hoppy lagers yeah. have been around forever. So yeah. if you want to market but, something different? Awesome. But now they're called cold IPAs because you just slap. I mean, I think IPA has almost become just like you could translate it to beer. Like that's just mm -hmm. kind of what the term yeah. IPA at this point has become. <laughs> but yeah, so a cold IPA is uh, India. So, could, so explain it. So is this is this something where you're you're cold hopping? Is that what you're doing at the end? Like no, it's literally children. it's just because it's a lagered beer that's hopped like because it's IPA lagered and it's hopped like an yeah. IPA. Okay, and hop out yeah. like an IPA. Okay, probably <laughs> dry hop to colder temperatures, which is happening a lot now. Right. So is it? Yeah. So is there an, is curious on that because you know obviously sometimes you have to cook ingredients in order to make sure that they become you know stable, right? I'm not talking, but so is there a concern with that uh, or, or is there a process that you do? I'm just curious. This is just me yeah. now. as a chef, like just curious how, how you do that. I think if you know your ingredients, um, specifically in this case is yeast, uh, you yeah. know what you're supposed to do. There's kind of standards for that and there's all kinds of calculations can happen that give you an idea. Um, and then it's just right. checking the process. You know, when you have mm -hmm. an expected final gravity that you're supposed to hit of right. that beer, you check it, you make sure it's stable before you do anything else. It's Got that it. That's easy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I only learned that there was such a thing, um, like maybe a month or so ago. It was, I, and it, it was like, I'd never yeah, heard it's of a new, it. And new then, terms to me for sure. And like, then I, two I times in one it. day, I, I like the, the term was brought up to me. So I'm, I'm bringing a rice log in the model that, are you? that had a hop from Ooh. Germany called Monroe. And it's supposed to be like all red berries. It's named after Marilyn Monroe, supposedly. It just sounded really interesting, and I thought it'd be a good summer beer. So I guess that kind of fits that vein because it's going to be relatively hopped and dry hopped, but it's only going to be like a four point, four point three percent or some little guy. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe. <laughs> I mean, just call it a rice yeah. IPA, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'll probably sell it twice as fast. <laughs> you will. Hundred percent, you will. <laughs> Because like the first time I heard of it was because Full Tilt is coming out with a beer that the label. Do you know the Steve Crowder meme where it's like something 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 changed my mind, yeah. and so it has that drawn with one of their characters, it <laughs> like sitting back and the sign says "Cold IPAs are just IPLs." Changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, so this is going to be on a on a every shelf near you, and kind of thing for the summer. Is that what's going to happen next? For this uh, I don't. I don't know because the. No, I think we're cold IPAs. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. Don't know, for IPLs, like, IPAs. Yeah. I have. I haven't heard. Well, IPLs crashed and burned. People yeah. kept trying to yeah. make that happen, and then it never it just did. didn't work. Yeah. But I, I mean, never this seen, could be. I've never seen that term. So I've never seen. This used. could be a classic like thing of where something that was not at all liked gets a rebranding and then all of a sudden it becomes really popular so yeah it may be i don't know I, at this point it's still only two different breweries that have 
like mentioned it to me. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know who started it or where it came from. So I, I guess time will tell. I assume with everything showing back up to in terms of like people being able to be out now, I think yeah. that tank times are going to be questionable for folks. I think the logger game is going to change a little bit for a little while. So I, I, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of places to try it, but you know, I don't, I don't foresee a world where that like catches hold again. What do you want to brew next? What do I want to brew next? Um, I'm working. I always, on... I always get asked what I'm gonna cook next, so I'm throwing that on you now. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a summer logger. Um, yeah, I, I'm figuring out something out. I, I got an idea in my head. I'm doing some work with uh, the guys at Monument City in Baltimore soon, and mm-hmm. I, I think I got a really good project in terms of like a good, refreshing. I don't want to say fruited summer logger, but like just some concepts to play around with, like you know. I, I'm going a lot of cocktail inspired things right now. So like, cool. If we can get something like Paloma based or something like that, you know, nice. I think would be like just crushable, just enjoyable for everybody. So mm-hmm. thinking about things like that these days, I got, you know, a similar series coming out soon. That's completely cocktail based. It's going to be similar to the beer we're making. Um, just higher ABV kind of sort of thing, but just mm-hmm. mixing all kinds of fruits, doing some playing off some tiki cocktails and fun stuff like that. So just trying to draw inspiration from different places and that's kind cool. of unique and interesting and just a little different. I never even looked at it that way. And I think that that's a very interesting possibility, you know, of a trend of like going that direction, like taking super classic cocktails and, and, and using it for the profiles for the beer. I, you know, yeah. I imagine an old fashioned being something that could happen. Yeah. I imagine a gin and tonic with seltzer happening. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's, I, I think that's pretty cool. I think that that's, that's untapped, uncapped possibilities. <laughs> wow, man. I just said that in. That's such a dad joke. Um, <laughs> uh, it's perfect, though. Yeah. <laughs> so what, um, what, which category do you prefer? Spirits, wine, or beer? Me? Yeah. Like, what, what do you well, enjoy in this more setting? Of? In this setting, it's going to be beer. <laughs> well, I mean, I... I, 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 I I drink it's, bourbon all the time. Yeah, I was going to say, Ben, ben yeah, hates beer. <laughs> so, you know, it's so funny. So a really a good friend of mine is Master Sommelier, right? Um, he was the youngest to ever get it at one point. So he's I, I worked with him years ago. I opened Charlie Palmer Steak with him. Um, he opened a range of restaurant I had at one point. So Keith Golson, he, you know, drinks the most incredible wine, like from out the entire plant, you know, all over the world, right? At the end of the shift, he drinks beer. You know, like just, you, it's just, you know, once you've had, you know, too much of one, it's time to go another. So I think that seasonally I drink, you know, like I, you know, everybody does that, right? You kind of have your thing over the course of the year. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a beer guy, you know, I, I, I that's, that's my deal. I, I really am. Um, I, I, I have to say that you know, I, I love and I enjoy craft cocktails. I am a bourbon guy too, um, for sure. And, and I love my beer. What's your go-to? Do you have like, a, like just a go-to beer that you always have around or is it an ever changing? Um, it's ever changing. So I, I do have to say, cause you know, I, I mean, there's the selections are incredible right now. Um, yeah, you know, like I, they're so, like, I think that, that yeah. question's so invalid nowadays. Like maybe it, it really eight is. years ago, I could have answered that question, but I couldn't even tell you the last time I had a beer that I had maybe even once before. <laughs> right. I mean, I have, you know, Hank is in my refrigerator right now. Um, That's a great beer. Uh, let's see. I had. Um, uh, I got a couple Zen Masters in there. Uh, from those guys. I got um, I got some Flying Dog, um, uh, the uh, you know Thunder Peel. You know I love that. It's fantastic. It, it just it changed. It, you know it changes. It's like really like when I go to the store, I'm like, all right, what am I gonna try next? Um, and and or it's going to be like, what am I having for dinner? Or like, are we gonna grill this again? Like, so I, I'll buy to that. Like that's that's definitely something I think about. Um, you know, did you like Zen Master? I did. Yeah, no, I did. I haven't, I, I, I haven't tried it because I hate matcha. I yeah, I know, and I was I was a little worried at first because again, like a lot of the times you're like 
but no, it's 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 super subtle with the matcha. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, I, I need I, to try I really that. It. Yeah, it was good. Um, you know, I was worried because we actually paired with that, um, and I did a, a dish with lamb, and I got some spruce tips. So, like when in springtime, you know, I, I'm the idiot that goes around to all of your yards, and I'm there taking off all of the little lime green spruce <laughs> tips off of your trees because you can cook with those. <laughs> um, and so I, I put that in, fuse that into the sauce, which I thought, even though it's not tea, it's just it brought this like heavy, sprucey sort of juniper sort of flavor to it, which I thought, you know, because it was a, you know, a slightly bitter, you know, beer, but I, I, it was, I thought it was a great pairing, you know, it worked really well. Um, so those kind of things, like I, I'm, I'm, I typically look for. Um, what else? And there might be some Miller Light in the refrigerator. I don't know. There's <laughs> <laughs> always the yellow. <laughs> Always, yeah, Always. you know, Vanilla and highlight just depends. On the I was camp. just gonna say, there, there's we, no shame I, in that because I, I oh. camp, man. Like, we go camping, yeah. like, you know, yeah. this is like campfire beer, <laughs> you know what I mean? Stuff like that, you know. A lot of brewers list high life as their favorite beer, yes, yes, 100%. <laughs> right? You know, I, I agree. Like, I, I, I can't even I believe in high life. <laughs> I yeah, believe like, in high I, life. The, the number of brewers who have told me they were going camping to just sit back and drink a bunch of high life. Like right. the number of times I've heard that is kind of absurd. And Ben well, has no, now, been now those- I feel, <laughs> now I feel cool. Now I feel I'm in a circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's, you don't have to drink it in shame anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> well, but also, but also a beer that just, you know, uh, you, from hot dogs to whatever, you know what I mean? It works yeah. with everything. I mean, oh, man. you don't have to sit there and think about it. It's just like yeah. one of those things. There's no dissecting it. There's no thinking. Mm-hmm. There's nothing. It's just enjoyment. And that, I mean, like for me, like a lot of times when I I crack someone else's beer open, like I, number one, I don't like to drink my own beer for some reason. I just don't. Right. Number two, like when I crack someone else's beer open, it's hard for me not to sit there and, and, and think about process and dissect it. And it just takes the enjoyment factor away from a lot of it or try to think how I could replicate it in my own way, whatever it may be. Like there's just very little enjoyment that comes with that. And that's kind of what, you know, the intent to me of beer is, is, is that little relaxation that kind of taken away from things, taken away from like every day. So being able to sit there and just enjoy without thinking with just like a good quality, easy, nothing going on. That's High Life Modelo, you know, let's right. to go something too. Yeah, High Life Modelo. Yeah, <laughs> if you're feeling point, fancy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fancy. If I want to buy a beer, I'll go for some yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a difference of like you know, for me, if I'm layering a lot of spice, like super spicy stuff, then I'm I'm Modelo, you know what I mean? Just you know, like if I'm going that route and cooking, um, you know, if I'm Old Bay other side, it's the high life, right? You know, that's yeah. the way it works. But um, you bring up something good. Like I don't know if I'm going off on a weird tangent or not, but like you know, thinking about the three profile, uh, like wine, spirits, beer, celebratory wine, champagne, celebratory uh, spirits, shots. No, not my thing. Uh, beer, though, like getting around like a bunch of friends, like hanging out backyard, like that's a day. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. to me, I don't know why, like it feels different. Like that's why, like I, I feel like you can organize an event around beer, right? <laughs> like, oh, without like, that, like camping, so my group, of, my group out, of friends, like, the text yeah, message of, a fire, hey, let's, like, yeah, beer, ex- like, that's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. Let's sit around the fire pit tonight and have some beer. Right. Yeah. It, and yeah. it doesn't matter what kind. <laughs> no, it, it's cultural. It's a social thing. There's no stickiness yeah. to it whatsoever. It's just like, it's just yeah. enjoyable. It's, you know, you know, nothing fancy or it can be, but I mean, like at the end of the day, like it, it, it's, I kind of guess like who we are culturally in a lot of ways. And it's kind of tied to that, you know, when you're going out, you're having beers, et cetera, you're staying home, inviting some friends over, you're having beers. So it's, I, I think it's just the fun part. And, you know, the, like I'm sitting in the tap room right now. And one reason we built this tap room the way we did was we want that environment to hang out, have beers. This is community. Um, right. This is when you have friends come into town. This is where you meet them. So like, I think like beer is, is based around that. And I think it's a, a big building block of who we are culturally. Yeah, definitely. I a hundred percent agree. I'm not taking away from the fact you can celebrate with the other stuff. I mean, don't even, oh, right. no, no, no. Spirit, but the fire pit, <laughs> the fire pit will be lit at seven 30. I'll see you guys later on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, have you ever sabered a champagne bottle? I have, yeah, definitely. Okay, um, I, I've sabered. So, I've, I've, I've sabered. Uh, I think I've sabered a seven fifty of backyard too. I did. Uh, so I say I've sabered beer. Yeah, so have I. 
and it was only because I became obsessed with the idea of sabering. Right. <laughs> and um, I have an official, like I have a guy who sent me one, and I was uh, like, "What do I do with this?" <laughs> I used. <laughs> I started using it. I have one. On I used an unsharpened bayonet. Uh, hey, and I sa- yeah, that sounds and dangerous. I, I, sa- I savored a bottle of beer that Ben had given me <laughs> for the really? first time, and now I and I, I recently recorded a podcast with Sane Lamprey, who at mm-hmm. one time held the. It wasn't an official world record because there was a bunch of things that went wrong, so Guinness didn't certify it. But at one of the Super Bowls. Mark Cuban had sponsored for him to to try to break the world record and he held it. So I challenged him when he comes to Baltimore for his comedy tour to a a sabering race. Uh, He he said he would do it. I don't know if we'll actually make it happen, but I need to start practicing. Yes, um, and I do. found that's that you awesome. can pretty much saber any glass bottle. So I think I'm just going to yeah, find just a follow, just bottles. follow the scene. Yeah. That's it. And then just like one one straight motion. That's it. And you're done. It's easy. Yeah, I have a machete. I've saber saber on. practice around the around the campfire. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get it done. It's the only way I open a bottle now. <laughs> <laughs> it should be. You know, you just carry that thing around your back pocket and pull it yeah. out whenever you need it. I, th- I think uh, Maryland has laws against that, but I'm I mean, sure I they. Wouldn't... I'm sure a lot of places have laws against carrying around a bayonet. <laughs> Just saying. All right. Oh, um, well, I guess let's do a rundown real quick. So it's um, District East opens at 10 a.m. on Saturday. What time does Four Score open? 11. 11. Um, okay. Sometimes we do the releases at 10 on the side. I, I haven't even talked logistically with the guys this week. I assume we are though. Um, so garage, we do ten o'clock sales. We open at eight. We probably don't want to do a, a, a beer and a dessert pairing at eight in the morning, but it will be available <laughs> <laughs> there shortly yeah. after going into the lunch session. Which you know, we, we, did, we did a similar thing with an ice cream, a local ice cream maker up here not too long ago. Did you? We yeah. had one or two people in line for it. <laughs> oh, I bet you did, man. <laughs> That's good. And I expect the same for for this weekend. It's going to be Absolutely. it's going to be a good one. I can't wait for the release. It's going to be awesome. Does showroom use goat milk in the oatmeal? In the oatmeal? Goat yeah. milk? No. No. Okay, right good. Now. Well, because when it when it used to be family meal, I would go there all the time. Yeah. I love the oatmeal. And then you switch to using goat milk and I didn't like it anymore. So like thankfully, <laughs> yeah, no. thankfully the breakfast sandwiches and omelets are amazing yes. also. So it switched yes, to they those, are. But, Got it. Um, <laughs> no goat milk. But I really, oatmeal. <laughs> okay, good. I can go back to getting oatmeal. <laughs> goat meal hmm. there yeah, no. but the goat milk did not I mean, i'm I sure people it. like it. it stayed that way for a while but i i just can't do goat yeah no, I got <laughs> so starting at some at various times on saturday look at social media it'll tell you yeah everywhere. so uh, yeah we'll, we'll open at noon i mean for lunch i mean you know 11 30 or so you know what i mean it's really starting to be available at the dessert menu so um, and it'll run all all day, but then you know, for us, it's going to be available then, obviously, until we uh, we've served the last the last can. So we're going to continue to to offer this promotion throughout the month of of May. Um, you know, hopefully for, for you know sales and and you know, obviously the the excitement that you know maybe we're going into something new over the summer. <laughs> we'll see, but, uh, so- but this is immediately going to be available starting on that. Um, I probably should have found this out before recording, uh, but do you have any idea if District East is going to be selling the sample sizes of the desserts too? They or just the will beer? have them, yes. Yeah. So we are oh, setting aside someone... some for District East. <laughs> uh, most are going up to up up to four score, and then we're taking um, the uh, the we're just doing the the actual dessert at, okay. at showroom. So. Um, you know, ours will be the full size portion dessert pairing with the beer. Perfect. Um, and so the sample, the sample bites. I mean, it's still it's going to be a you know pretty substantial tart. I mean, it's going to be pretty fun. Yeah. Um, you know, so it'll, it'll be a blood orange tart with the toast of meringue and the, and the coconut flavor. So it's going to be, I think, an incredible couple bite you know pairing with that beer. Um, I look forward to it. It's great. I um, mean, only because I feel like I can't talk about toasted coconut coconut without bringing this up. Nick Fertig, one of the founders of Full Tilt, once I can't remember how many pounds it was uh, toasted himself. It wasn't um, more than 150. Okay, uh, it was a lot because <laughs> well, they they brewed 
uh, like really large batches at wow. when they were contract I know, brewing. I bet, I, I bet they did. If yeah. He toasted hundreds of pounds, I think, of coconut himself in his oh, no. in his kitchen, and oh, then no. learned that you could just buy it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're welcome, Nick. Uh, that's that sounds like a chef. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I will toast my own coconut. Like, <laughs> toast it to. To 300, I'm a, you know, my oven's gonna be at 396 and a half degrees while I'm toasting. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, you peak what 397, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and to find Brian personally, you're at Brian Voltaggio everywhere, right? Yeah, I keep it simple. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you for being a part of this beer. I uh, can't wait to try it and try it with the dessert. And will, will you be out on Saturday? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to it. It's going to be amazing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to kick it off on Saturday. Um, you know, it'll be available all weekend and then, you know, going into next week. So, you know, anybody who's, you know, obviously tuned in and watching this, if you can't get out this weekend, come see us next week. We're, we're going to have the pairing um, throughout the entire month. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, thank you, everyone, for watching thank and you. listening. Cheers. Right. Thanks for having me. Take care, guys.